Greetings, folks, and welcome to History of the English Language. As you all know, this is going to be rather an unusual year, and we faculty folks have been doing our best to try to figure out how we can give you the best experience, given the constraints of not being able to meet face to face. Each course is probably going to be a little bit different, because of course, the subject matter in each course is a little bit different, and we all do our best to accommodate our presentation to the subject matter. So for our first lecture today, what I'd like to do is lay out how the course is going to run, and then talk to you a little bit about the origins of language and the, the ancient origins of the predecessors to the English language. I hope you find that the way we go about things in this course is satisfactory or satisfying. And before we get into anything else, I would just like to let you know that I'm always open to suggestions if there's something that we're doing that isn't quite working for you. So bear that in mind. You, you've, you've always got a voice in what we're doing. Oh, it also just occurs to me, maybe I should introduce myself. Um, <laughs> I'm Dr. Roger Wilkie. Uh, you can call me whatever you want. I don't really care. I'm not a stickler for formalities. I've been in the English department since about 2002, and my PhD was in Beowulf. I've had a lifelong love of both heroic narrative and medieval English literature generally. And, this may sound odd, a really deep fascination with grammar. Which I guess is why it occurred to me several years ago to propose and design this course. In any case, I think it's time to move on and let you know in some detail what we're going to be up to this term. So let's start with the basics. Why are we here? Well, my understanding of the course, what I want to achieve with the course, what I want you to get out of it, is a combination of linguistic, historical, and political understandings or approaches to the English language. That is, as with any language, the history of English is a very interesting story with many dimensions. It's not just a question of what words we use and what sounds we make, although the linguistic elements are actually really, really interesting, and we will be spending a fair bit of time on those. But it's also a way of looking at the people who speak the language. That is, language is an approach to history, I think. It offers a way in to the history of the language community. And this is something that's been a fascination of mine for many, many years. How did this very small language come to be the most widely spoken language in the world? What historical circumstances, what political developments lie behind the, the spread of English and its transition from basically a provincial language of relatively little importance to a global language of commerce, of politics, and of scientific discourse. So accordingly, we won't just be looking at linguistics and linguistic laws, we'll be looking at political history as it relates to the English language. And I think you'll find that it's a really interesting story. As for the textbook, we're using Stephen Gramley's History of English, an Introduction, 2nd Edition. I've ordered copies into the bookstore, so if you're in town, that might be the most convenient place for you to buy it. But as we're working online this year, you're certainly more than welcome to use the ebook rather than the hard copy. It's less expensive, and you can purchase it directly from Rutledge. Similarly, if you're an Amazon fan and you don't plan on holding on to the book beyond the end of term, you can actually rent it from Kindle for a fraction of the cost of buying it. So it's entirely up to you how you access the text, as long as you access the text. Also, we are using the second edition, but if you can get your hands on a used copy of the first edition and save yourself a bit of money that way, honestly, that'll be fine too. As long as you're using some version of Gramley's text, we can find a way to make it work. Now, as for what we're actually going to be doing on any given week, it's actually pretty straightforward. I will post lectures twice weekly. I will post lectures twice weekly, no later than Monday and Wednesday at noon. The lectures will be in this format, audio lectures accompanied by PowerPoints. I will also be making the PowerPoints available individually, so you can use those if you want as a basis for making your own notes. I hope you don't mind that I'm not filming myself. 
but quite frankly, my face isn't all that important. I'll also be periodically posting additional language clips. Some of these will be simply me reading in various versions of English as the course requires, and some of them will be YouTube clips of other people giving examples of whatever language or dialect we happen to be looking at. Because, of course, there's no point in studying a language as a language if you're not going to be hearing examples of how it actually sounds. On Fridays, we will be having a regular Teams chat at 12.30, which is the time when our class is actually scheduled to be at. The purpose of these chats is not for me to lecture at you more. Uh, it's to make sure that you're doing okay. So it's a, a weekly time to all touch base, to share ideas, to share thoughts, to share whatever insights you may actually have, and also for you to field questions if you need some clarification on the material. These may or may not take an entire hour, I don't know, and it may vary from week to week, quite frankly, but it gives us some time, it will give us some time to conduct ourselves in as close a manner to a face-to-face -face class as we can actually manage, given the way things have to be this year. Of course, I will be keeping regular office hours as well. This term, I'm available from 2 to 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoon, and that simply means I will be lurking by my computer, and you can get a hold of me directly there. I'm not sure yet whether I want to do this as a Teams office hour or whether I'll simply be lurking on the Moodle forum, in which case you can just post direct questions and I can respond to them. But I will make sure that I am available and by the time we're a week or two into the course, I'll have figured out which way is probably the best to handle the types of question you're likely to have. And again, I am always open to suggestions, to comments, this is new for me, but it's also new for you, and we're all kind of figuring this out together as we go along. Now, at this point, you're probably all wondering what I might ask you to do. So, let's talk about assignments and grading. I've modified my usual lineup of assignments to try to accommodate to our current reality, and this is what I've come up with. I'll be asking you to write two short essays. By short essays, I mean about 1,500 words each of which is worth 20% of your final grade. These essays will involve some research. I'll ask you to use no fewer than two, but probably no more than four academic sources. So nothing terribly onerous. And I will ask that all of your research be done through the library. Of course, you can't physically go to the library, it's closed, but they have excellent online resources. And quite frankly, when I'm doing my own research, it's almost exclusively these days electronic resources that I use. The essays will be assigned about one month before they're due, so you'll have plenty of time to work on them. And when I assign the first essay, I will give you a substantial bibliography of library holdings so that you have some idea of the type of material that you might look at when you're investigating whatever question you decide to investigate. Now, I've got kind of an idiosyncratic extension policy where essays are concerned. I've been doing this for the last few years and have received quite favorable feedback on it. Basically, it's this. The essay assignment will come with a deadline. That is the deadline you want to meet if you want commentary on your paper. This deadline is followed by a grace period. For the first paper, it will be a grace period of two weeks, during which you can submit your paper anytime. You will not receive a penalty of any kind, but you also won't receive any written commentary. You'll just receive a grade. After two weeks, I will not accept your paper. Now, what this means is that you don't need to ask me for an extension. This is basically me treating you like grown-ups. If you get your paper in by the first deadline, you get commentary, but I recognize you have time management challenges, other courses, etc. And the extra time for my paper may make it easier for you to handle your other work. But that extra time comes at a cost, and the cost is commentary. This is just all you need to know to make up your mind as to how to budget your time. Beyond that, it's entirely up to you. So you don't need to ask me for an extension. Just look at your circumstances and act accordingly. For the second essay, the grace period may not be quite two weeks, depending on when I need to get my final grades in, because of course your, pa your final paper won't be due until pretty much the end of term. But it will be at least one week, 
probably something like 10 days. I'll let you know. I'll also be asking you to write three reflections. These reflections require no research. Each of them is worth 5% of your grade, and each should be about 500 words long. Say plus or minus 50. Your reflections will be posted to the Moodle page for other students to comment and will form at least part of the basis for the Moodle forum, the discussion that we have running through the term. So it's, it's a record of your thoughtful engagement with the material. For these, the deadlines are absolute. That is, they need to be posted to the Moodle page no later than midnight of the day that they are due. And late postings will be penalized. Now, I mentioned a Moodle forum. 20% of your grade will be engagement with me and each other online. Some of this will be done through Moodle and some of it will be done through Perusal. The Moodle forum will largely be based around your own reflections and responses to them. I may also just post a few questions or thoughts for you to respond to. In Perusal, which is a brand new technology to me, so I'm still figuring it out, I will sometimes post short passages in one or another dialect of English for the class to collaboratively comment on. I'm actually looking forward to seeing how some of those go. For the final 25% of your grade, there will be an exam. The exam will be essay-based, and I will give you more detail on that as we go. My plan is to not throw any curveballs at you, not give you any surprises to make sure that you know everything that's coming up well in advance so that you can budget your time accordingly. So, okay, enough of the housekeeping. Let's get into why we're really here. I'd like to start with just a few fairly closely related questions. And you can think about these. I may say a few things about them myself, but hopefully not too much to influence your own thoughts. Do you feel an emotional attachment to your first language? and Why or why not? What does it mean to be a creature who uses language? And what's the relationship between language and culture, language and politics, language and identity, both public and private? That is, broadly speaking, what's your relationship to language? How does language influence your sense of yourself, your sense of who and what you are? There are very few things in the world, I think, more political than language. Economics to a degree, religion to a degree, political alignment to a degree. Those are the only ones I can think of. And as you're thinking about these questions, and I am going to ask you to think about them at length, consider the way your experience of being in the world is influenced, is mediated by language. We think in language. That's not to say we have no mental experiences that aren't linguistic, but we think in language for the most part. This is very intimate, and this is foundational for, for how we actually see the world. And it puts up difficulties for the possibility of reaching across linguistic divides, which are very often political divides. That is, if, if the words you use are the substance of your thoughts, and a lot of the words you use don't translate exactly into someone else's language, and the words they use at least some of the words they use, don't translate exactly into your language. Precise communication, even with the best possible will, is really, really difficult. And that's not even getting into grammar. Grammar is the relationship between words, the different functions of words. And grammar, of course, varies from language to language, which means the ways in which words relate to each other is going to be different from language to language. And from the point of view we're looking at it right now, what this means also is that the way our thoughts fit together, the way our thoughts flow, are going to be different from language to language. Any of you who has a second or third language will recognize immediately that you experience the world differently when you're thinking in one language and when you're thinking in another, or when you're reading in one language and reading in another. And it's precisely because language is bound up in both the texture and the substance of, of your thoughts. Or, if I can throw a couple more at you, how does language both enable and constrain the development of ideas? Now, I've kind of touched upon that one already. Or, consider language as a cognitive technology. What role does this technology play in our conception of human nature? That's a fun one. Um, a cognitive technology is 
a technology that we use strictly in our mind, but it meets the definition of technology insofar as it's a made thing. It is something that's the product of, of, of human effort and human thought aimed at enhancing both our understanding and our control of the environment in which we live and through which we move. So language can be understood as a technology in that regard, as, as can math, for example. And if you're interested in reading more about that, I, I first encountered this idea in a wonderful book by Andy Clark, a neuroscientist, called Natural Born Cyborgs. But to return to the question, what role does language play in our conception of, of human nature itself? I mean, I can give you a hint. One of the old English words for human being is rerbärend, which means speech bearer. That is, to be a bearer of speech is to be human, and to be human is to be a bearer of speech. If any of you have read the wonderful Old English epic Beowulf, you'll remember that one of the things that defines the first monster, Grendel, as being inhuman is that he cannot speak. He has no language. And, and the medieval Anglo-Saxons were not alone in equating language with something that is essentially human. And as I said, I really want you to think about these things. And what better way to do that than in writing your first reflection? So what I'd like you to do is by midnight, September 16th, post to the Moodle forum roughly 500 words, plus or minus 50, responding to one of these questions. The only formal constraint I'm placing on this is that I expect you to write clearly using proper grammar but it doesn't need to follow essay structure. It doesn't need to be impersonal. Feel free to use the first person. Just engage the question as directly and honestly as you can and post your reply so that we can start doing the best we can to convey as much as possible of the classroom experience online. So in other words, post these for comments and feel free please to comment on what other people post. I look forward to seeing your thoughts. And as long as we're on the topic of just language at its most general, how many species actually use language? The ancient world, the medieval world, the Anglo-Saxons, as I just mentioned, the ancient Greeks, certainly, had the luxury of not knowing any other species that use language. That is, they had the luxury of ignorance. So they could see language as a uniquely human attainment, as a, as a defining human attribute. We don't have that luxury, and there are a number of reasons why we don't. So let's pause on these for a second. There are, for instance, a number of species of cetacean, of whale, that communicate with sound in highly stylized ways across long distances. I'm partly speaking of whale song, but I'm also speaking of the way in which some whale song has been analyzed. Not all whales, not all whale song, but some species. For example, dolphins. There are particular patterns of sound that dolphins use to recognize each other. Particular clicks and whistles that stand for a particular dolphin. Our word for that is names. And there are other species of whale that we now know have names as well. Now, names are language. Not only are names language, names are one of the most intimate uses of language. And given the social nature of dolphins, and given the size of their brains, this honestly shouldn't be terribly surprising. That is, the evolutionary trajectory that produced dolphins is in many ways similar to the trajectory that produced us. We're both social species with a need to communicate, and as our brains become bigger, the complicated nature of what is communicated increased. And as our social networks became more and more complex, so did our use of sound to articulate and convey and build those, those networks. The same patterns have been identified in dolphins. But okay, let's leave dolphins for now. This isn't a course in biology. It's not a course in dolphin language. Let's confine ourselves to human beings. How many species of human being have used language? Now, unfortunately, the only human species left standing is us. And by human, I mean 
belonging to the genus Homo. So we certainly know that we use language. But there's a strong possibility that one of our nearest cousins, Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals, also used language. And <laughs> given that we and Neanderthals have a common ancestor, and we'd have to add Denisovans to this as well, because Denisovans and Neanderthals are very closely related, we just don't have any Denisovan skulls. But given that we and Neanderthals probably have some common ground in the use of language, then it stands to reason that we didn't develop it independently, but that we inherited the capacity from our common ancestor, our nearest common ancestor, which in this case is Homo heidelbergensis. Now that evolutionary split was more than half a million years ago. But how do I say, why would I say that Neanderthals possibly, and I would say quite probably, used some form of language. And the answer has to do with brain casts. We have no Neanderthal brains. Brains don't tend to fossilize. They're mushy. They rot fast. But the inside of a skull reveals the shape of the brain that it once held. And brain casts, that is, plaster poured into a skull and then taken out when it hardens, can reveal the shape of the brain inside. And it turns out that the cerebral regions associated with speech in our brains were also present in Neanderthals. So they had the cerebral equipment to speak. Their voices would have sounded very different from ours, and not in ways that you might suppose. <laughs> their, uh, their larynxes, which are also essential to speech, were, were higher up in their throats. What this means, even though our, our sense of who Neanderthals were, these big hulking brutes, they had a much higher uh, muscle-to-bone ratio than we do. But they would have had very high voices, uh, because the higher up in your throat your larynx is, the higher your voice. But that said, their larynxes were big enough to accommodate at least some of the demands of language. So their language, such as it was, would have been very, very different from anything we do. We would certainly call it more rudimentary. But the odds of us and Neanderthals independently developing the same equipment after splitting off from our nearest common ancestor are, are astronomically small compared to the odds of us inheriting those capacities and just developing them a little differently along our separate trajectories. So, so what I want to leave you with on this slide is we are not unique in the use of language. Now, we are unique in the way we use language. I know a lot of people like to think of human beings as special and sure, fine, we're special. We're very special when measured by our own standard. So is any other species, by the way, but fine. We're special because our standard is the standard we most care about, peachy. The other thought I want to leave you with on this slide, because we're not done yet, is that language is not all or nothing. That is, you don't have a complete absence of anything that we could call language and then flip a switch in your brain and all of a sudden you're reciting Shakespeare. Like any other attribute that we develop over time, over evolutionary time, it develops by small increments. How would it first have developed? Well, for that, we need to look back to where and how we evolved, for example, on the, on the African savanna in fairly sizable bands, social primates that we are. Well, what would be the needs? The needs would involve coordinating a hunt, for instance. You can coordinate a hunt a whole lot better if you can talk. Needs would involve warnings about predators because we were not the top of the food chain. That's a very recent development. So when we speak of language, we need to speak of it following sort of a growth pattern rather than being any kind of binary thing. Which means, of course, as well, that whatever attainments we have made linguistically now these also aren't absolute. They can't be seen as absolute. We have no idea what the evolutionary future is going to hold, which means we have no idea what language is going to look like if anyone's still around to speak it 100,000, 200,000 years from now. But okay, let's move a little bit closer to where we're going to be spending our time this term. 
Let's assume from now on that language means something like what we use today. And that being the case, then it seems that the origin of that particular Homo sapiens version of language dates somewhere between 150,000 years ago, probably at the earliest, to 50,000 years ago, almost certainly at the latest. Okay, so why those times? The archaeological record in Africa shows evidence of fairly extended trade networks as far back as about 140, 141,000 years or so. The existence of trade is strong circumstantial evidence for the existence of some kind of complex language. And it's unlikely that the trade and the language emerged simultaneously. So if the trade existed 140,000 years ago, say, probably people had been speaking something like what we would call language for a while before that. So 150,000 years is really the earliest date at which we can say there was a fair possibility of there being language kind of like what we use. At the other end, 50,000 years ago is the point of transition from Paleolithic to Mesolithic, that is from the Old Stone Age to the Middle Stone Age. This transition is called the Great Leap. There was at that time a sudden, sudden in evolutionary terms, increase in both the quantity and the quality and the diversity of the kind of technology that people were making. And that complexity of technology is very difficult to explain in the absence of language. Virtually impossible, really. And it appears as well that our societies became at that time more complex as well. And again, when you've got complexity socially and technologically, explaining that without language is very, very difficult. So we tend to take 50,000 years ago as the point at which there was, beyond reasonable doubt, something like what we now call language. Now, considering that our species is somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years old, and I'll take the conservative number here and say 200,000, then it's only for the last quarter of our existence that we've been using speech in ways that are sufficiently complex and nuanced to be called language in the contemporary sense. But even so, it's only 5,000 years ago that we started writing things down. So most languages that have ever been spoken are gone without a trace. And for someone who loves digging into old mythologies um, and, and old narratives and who likes to take things back as far as he possibly can, this is supremely frustrating because I want to know what all of those lost generations thought and I want to know how all of those lost generations thought and we never will. And with that being said, I should probably assign you a little bit of reading. Now, as this is our first week and we haven't really had a lot of time to get any content under our belts yet, this Friday I'll be posting a lecture and we'll begin our weekly Friday Teams meetings next Friday. So, in preparation for this Friday's lecture, please read Chapter 1, or as much of it as you can get through between now and then. And I would also like you to have Chapter 2 read by Wednesday. This is the only time in the course I will ask you to read two chapters in less than a week. Our usual pace would be much more leisurely than that, no more than one chapter a week, and sometimes less. So you shouldn't find the reading demands odious. In our next lecture, I'll be talking to you about the Indo-European language family and the history of English prior to the existence of the English language. So just getting us set up so that we can start talking about the language that we're actually here to study. So with that being said, thank you for listening. And I do look forward to getting into our substantial discussions of, of what I think is a really wonderful story, as I said. Though we won't be having our team's meeting this Friday, because as I said, we haven't really had a lot of content yet. I will be available for my usual Thursday office hour, so if you have any questions, do feel free to get a hold of me. And I should also say, I'm not only available during my office hours. If that hour doesn't work for you, then let me know via email or Teams or Moodle 
and I will make arrangements to speak with you. So as a final word, I'll just say that I am looking forward very much to getting to know you as a group and as individuals, and that I hope you enjoy this course. I hope that you find the story we're about to explore together as interesting as I do. I'm sure it will surprise you in some ways, and sometimes I'm quite sure it will also delight you. So until next time, thank you again. Please be safe, take good care of yourselves, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now.